<laughs> That's about right. Uh, well, we are on Facebook Live now, everyone. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, introduction to Shane Ward for all those listening and all those coming on. I see a whole lot of people coming onto Facebook now, which is great. Um, like I was saying, uh, Shane Ward is a family member of, of uh, Tammy and myself. It's uh, Tammy's cousin. Um, so we just want to welcome Shane. Shane is one of those family members that um, families always brag about. We've all got that one family member. Whenever there's a conversation, we talk about that person. Shane is that person. So we're going to uh, release him onto the world, if that makes sense. If you've read his bio, Shane has uh, had achieved great success in the business world from owning his own business to uh, directing to doing a whole lot of stuff in terms of the business world, which has been successful. Also now, um, I follow him on his Facebook page where he does motivational speaking, life coach, et cetera, et cetera. And his words are always inspirational, always encouraging. And so with that, I want to welcome Shane Ward uh, to the meeting. And we're going to hand over to him at this time. So go ahead, Shane Ward. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the introduction. I always like to start with something that Paul said. Um, and he said, I come to you in weakness, not with persuasive words or articulate words, but I come to you with the Holy Spirit so that the work that gets done here today, the power that is released among us, you will know is not mine, but is the Lord's. Whenever I speak to people, I always, if I speak to a Christian group, I always have an expectation that the Holy Spirit will dwell among us and will impact us powerfully because my words are weak, but mixed in with the power of the Holy Spirit, they are supernaturally powerful. And when I speak to commercial enterprises and I'm not sure, I can see there's, there's Muslims and Hindus in the crowd and I can see, um, from the rest of the crowd that they, there's not necessarily believers. It's just a cross section of love. My only request to God is not that I speak well, not that I speak articulately, not that I wow the audience, but that these people who are here to listen to me may glimpse just a sliver of who Christ is within me. Because if they do that, then for me, I know my talk has not just been beneficial, but it has been rich and it has been powerful. So that was a long intro. Um, I wanted to speak to you guys about three things. Some of them will be relevant to lockdown and some of them will just be relevant to life. But it would be remiss of me not to begin with the word identity, because in my view, this is where it all starts for us as Christian people. And I use this like it should be used as a Christian analogy, but I use it also as an analogy in business. So often I see in the church that I belong to, I see people put their hands up, come to the front of the church and somebody says something to them, every now and again, it might be my wife and I, and then they get a welcome pack. And I always wonder what happens to them. I've interrogated it a bit lately, and, and that's going to be our new ministry. But I think what happens in the minds of the people, when you put your hand up and you go up to the front, it is a life-changing moment. It, it really is. Your life will never be the same again. But God partners with you. It's not, not all up to God. There's a part that you need to play. My concern is when people go up, the minute they're home, they're so, they're so filled with absolute joy as you would be when you realize that you've committed your life to Christ. And then I think that some of them on Monday morning, they, the first thing they do is they write two lists a list of the things they need to stop doing because they're now a Christian, and then the list of the things 
they need to start doing now that they're a Christian. And it's not really how God works. I mean, if you have an intimate relationship with Christ, you will know that, that that's not how it works. So I wanted to talk to you about identity. Because by writing 10 things you shouldn't do and writing 10 things you should do, what you're trying to do is influence your behavior, but you've just started at the wrong place. Once you've identified Christ as your personal savior, you have planted a seed within you. That seed may not flourish into a flower immediately, but that seed is planted and you have taken on a new identity. You have taken on the identity of Christ. That is, I want to stop there. I could stop there and just speak about that because my body is full of goosebumps when I say things like that because you were this person and by confessing with your mouth, believing with your heart in a public forum, putting up your hand and believing that Jesus Christ is Lord, you take on a new identity. And that identity is righteous, and it is good, and it is clean, and it is wonderful. Now, when you believe that, because one thing, getting that identity, but when you fully believe who you are, that that is how God sees you, then something special happens. Then you can chuck your lists away. Because what will happen on the inside will start manifest, manifesting on the outside. And so when you believe how much God loves you, when you start getting that revelation, you will start loving more. When you believe how much God has forgiven you, you will start forgiving more. And so what happens is, once we understand our identity of Christ, everything about us changes. And those are the things It starts with thinking. So we start thinking differently. We start behaving differently. What does all that mean? It means that once we fully, truly believe, we've almost had a revelation in us, this revelation that our identity is not ours anymore. Our identity is found in Christ. Then what happens is your thinking changes to be more like Christ's thinking. You see the world more like Christ did. And therefore, the way you behave and act is more like Christ did. Now, that's a beautiful thing. That is, that is for me, how my Lord works. Because the law on a thousand things to do will happen naturally. And you could probably go back to your list in, in a year's time and open that list up and you will find the things that you didn't want to do you probably aren't doing but it wasn't because you made a conscious effort not to do it it's because Christ inside of you the Holy Spirit convicted you that those were not things that were pleasing the things that you started to do are, are perhaps also on the list but there are things that you started to do because inside your spirit is a welling up of love, of peace, and of joy, and you want to give it away. That, that's when you know it's from God, when you, want to, when you feel it and you want to give it away. How many of you watched a movie that you've absolutely loved, and the minute you're back home, you tell five people that you have to go see it? That is the love of Christ. When, when the love of Christ and all that he has done for you has an internal manifestation. It is impossible for your thinking and your actions to stay the same. In fact, faith without works is quite useless in my view. Maybe it's a radical statement and Pastor Ryan will uh, uh, take you all aside later and say his doctrine's a bit wrong and, and he may be right. But for me, faith without works is, is a bit useless. In other words, when we have a revelation of who Christ is for me, for Shane Ward, it is impossible. It was impossible for me to live the exact same life I did before. Because there's something so beautiful 
something so incredible, something so powerful that happens that it is not possible to think the same, to act the same, for our behaviors to be identical. So that is our identity. Now I want to tell you a story, a secular story, but I'm going to, I'm going to move it. So we're going to move on. Our identity is done. We're going to talk about seeing as believing. Now watch me on the screen here. Seeing is believing. Did you see the question mark? Can you guys all hear me? Yeah, you can. Okay. So I started to worry there. <laughs> So seeing is believing with a question mark. Because I don't, I don't believe that statement. That's why I've questioned it. I'll be going to go on a little bit of a journey, but first I want to start with the Wright brothers. Then if you see me turn, it's because I'm going to some of my notes that, that are better articulated if I just read them. But the Wright brothers, uh, we all know them, eh? Um, Orville Wright and Wilbur Wright, they wanted to learn how to fly, and it was in the late 1800s. What we don't know about learning to fly in the late 1800s is that we think it's the Wright brothers and one or two others. Everybody was learning to fly in the late, in the late 1800s. It was like dot com of the 90s. Do you know when the tech bubble, everybody was flying? And there was a reason for it. They, there were a few politicians and a few warmongers who thought, War was on the horizon, and this would certainly, owning the scars would certainly have massive benefit um, in warfare. So in the late 1800s, I'm going to take two people, or two, two sets of people, and put them in parallel. Then I'm going to ask you a question. Because this is, when you really ask the right questions, the answers become incredible. And, and this is about asking the right question. So we've got Samuel Langley on this side here. Samuel Langley is a tertiary educated individual. He has a seat on the Smithsonian, which is the uh, greatest museum in the United States. He is, sits on a number of boards. He is a very smart individual. Um, I think he has a degree in physics. Um, and he has he is employed by the government and the Smithsonian Museum, the, the two of them funded him. And they gave him a, 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 an amount of 50,000 US dollars in the late 1800s. That was an, a massive amount of money. And they said, Samuel, you're the brightest guy we've got. We're giving you access to the brightest brains we have. Go learn to fly. So Samuel, had all the time he needed, was a full-time job. He had all the money he needed, was a full-time job. And he had all the resources, the brain power, the materials that he needed. And then in Dayton, a few hundred miles to the left now, we go to Dayton, Ohio. And in Dayton, Ohio, we have Orville and Wilbur Wright, who own a bicycle shop. What they do is they design bicycles, they repair bicycles, and they sell bicycles. Now, you can only imagine what sort of money they're making from their bicycle shop. I just don't think it's a fortune, um, but they, they're getting along. And these two brothers want to fly. And if you look at the three resources, Tom, Samuel Langley, had it was a full-time profession, paid for. The Wright brothers, had when the bicycle shop closed and weekends. That's it. Money, 50,000 US dollars. Money, the proceeds from what they earn from their bicycle shop. Access to mines, all the access that the United States could give them. Access to mines, no college education, no degrees, and access to the mines of their friends who were willing to help them. So why? Why did the Wright brothers in late 1902, I think it's the 16th of December 1902, 
Why did the Wright brothers get man-powered flight right and Samuel Langley didn't? And then when the Wright brothers got it right, he resigned. How can, how can two brothers with no resources get something that has changed the way we do life forever? How do they get it right and the other doesn't? The truth is, Samuel Langley had a job and the Wright brothers had a dream. The Wright brothers had a dream that if they could get this right, that they could take people across lands, across continents, and they could change the face of the world forever. Samuel Langley just had a job and to underline that, when that job was fulfilled by the Wright brothers, he resigned. You see, dreams and passions are the things that ignite us. When the Wright brothers wanted to fly, they never knew how. They were fixing bicycles, but dreaming of eagles. Isn't that a, doesn't that tingle your spine? Fixing bicycles, but dreaming of eagles. As a church, as businessmen, we need to be doing what we need to be doing, but we need to be dreaming of eagles because it is the continuation of dreaming that is the birthplace. My concern in this coronavirus lockdown period is that people are watching their futures disappear. Yesterday, I spent two hours and the day before an hour interviewing a psychologist to understand her effects on people right now and her effects on people going forward. One very insightful thing is she said, some of her patients absolutely love lockdown because the world's just come to like a beautiful place for them. But for the most of us, we are concerned. And what are we concerned about? We're concerned about our future. We look ahead. We wonder when we will start our jobs again. My business started on the 22nd of January. <laughs> so if you want to say, you know, I want to, I want to make this joke because I'm going to make it from a human perspective, but it's, it's classic. I should win the award. If there's an award for when do you want, if the question was, when do you want to start your business at the worst possible economic time the world has ever known, when would it be? Well, the 22nd of January when I launched mine was probably, I'm in the top five. But you know, the truth of the matter is, that is just a, a human statement. And I believe truly, which is why I'm not stressed, why I'm not panicking, I believe truly that God has a plan for me in all of this. And it's one I want, I want to give to you. When the world falls around and, and people are tripping all over each other, keep a cool head because we live in a different place. We're only, we only on the earth, but we're not of the earth. We live in a higher realm. If you can keep on that higher realm, and I'm going to show you how, then all the river of fear flows below you. And every now and again, it might splash up and touch the soles of your feet, but you will not be immersed in that river. You will not be going on that journey. So dream. My worry is you guys that I'm talking to have stopped dreaming. My worry is that the world has stopped dreaming because the world is in paralysis of inaction. People are looking at their futures disappearing and they are paralyzed and they think they will pick up their lives when they're told to go back to work or when this happens or when that happens or when that happens. We have an opportunity to dream up a better tomorrow. To ask God to inject his wisdom into us so that we could dream up a better tomorrow. So that when we have dreamt that better tomorrow, that we can start making plans to live that better tomorrow. Okay, to my notes. In the natural, we have five senses, but in faith, we have a spiritual sense that operates in a higher realm. If you are only operating in your natural five senses, you are operating in the carnal realm, 
and you will be deceived and misled by the enemy. That is why identity that I've just spoken about is so important. Because when we know who we are in Christ, it's not easy for Satan to deceive us. When you are open to the things of God, even the clearest presentation, now remember, we're still seeing as believing. So I want to start putting some proof behind this. When you are not open to the things of God, you've got a closed mind. Even the clearest presentation of facts will not be believed. The religious leaders who witnessed many of Jesus' miracles were blind to, to them. But then there were three blind men who, who, who called Jesus the son of David. When, when Jesus said, what, what, what do you guys want? They said, we want our sight, Lord. And he felt compassion on them, and he touched their eyes, and they were healed. Look at that as an incredible paradox about presentation of facts, religious leaders actually witnessing miracles with their physical eyes, but not believing them. And then people whose physical eyes did not work were blind, call out to the son of David, and say, my Lord. And when he answers them, what do you want? They, they plainly say, we want our sight, my Lord. And he opens their eyes. You see, sight with our physical eyes is overrated. Sight through a manifestation of what Jesus Christ has given us is where power and strength and real vision comes from. And those who had the greatest presentation of facts of miraculous works denied them as sorcery, as all sorts of things. They made up a whole lot of ideas why they shouldn't be what they are. They, they... And these blind guys shouted out through faith in their heart and they were healed. We're going to look, I want to give you a couple of examples. Look at the example of two kings where you know that Elisha was giving um, secrets to, to the Israelites. So there's the Syrian army is coming to get you. The Syrian army was serious about getting them. And Ron, you need to um, excuse me if I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit... Um, I speak very plainly about these things. You can correct the doctrine after it. The message is correct. So the correct. Syrian army were really after the Israelites, but Elisha was the key, the, the, the secret ingredient. So he would be, he would get through a revelation where the Syrian army would be waiting in ambush and he would feed it back and then they would change their route. And eventually, after this happening a few times, the Syrian king calls his, his trusted soldiers in. And he said, he says, there is a traitor among you. Or there are many traitors. Because, it, you know, on the first time I thought, okay, perhaps. On the second time, wow, that's quite a coincidence. But on repeatedly now, every time we set up an ambush, these guys go the other way. I'm going to behead you all. And one guy in fear puts his hand up and says, he says, it's not us. There's this guy called Elisha. He hears from God. He tells them where to go. We need to go get this guy. So they assemble the entire army. These guys meant business. Eh? They assemble the entire army and Elisha is in his tent and he is sleeping. And his manservant wakes before him. When he wakes, he looks up in the hills and he is surrounded by the Syrian army. Whew. It must be quite something when it's you and your boss. So he wakes up Elisha and says, we've got trouble. And they look up and they are absolutely surrounded. It must be thousands to one. And Elisha says, what is your trouble? He says, my trouble is what I see. He said, but I don't see what you see. And then he turns to God, Elisha, and he says, Lord, open his eyes. Now, 
Here comes the crux. The manservant's eyes were already opened. Otherwise, he would not have been able to take in what he had seen, put it into his brain, process it, and speak it to Elisha. Elisha was not talking about his physical eyes. He was talking about his spiritual eyes. He said, open his eyes. And when he did, he saw what Elisha saw, which was soldiers and chariots and angels blazing with fire. The battle had turned through visual, through seeing spiritually, not through seeing naturally, through seeing with, seeing with your spiritual eyes. The battle had turned heavily in the favor of Elisha and his manservant. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but they lead them into captivity blind, this whole army. And then they let them go and say, now leave us go. Blindness is a terrible affliction. Spiritual blindness is equally as bad. Spiritual blindness happens when you are not open to the things of God. So we keep questioning, seeing as believing. Last example, I think. Um, in Joshua 6, see that I've delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. But the battle had not taken place yet. Do you know that? When you read that sentence, see that I've delivered Jericho into your hands. It's king and it's grounds and it's fighting men. You, when I first read that, I just glossed over it. But then I came back and I said, they had not taken Jericho. So what is God calling them to do? He's calling them to see it before it happened. That's spiritual sight. He's calling them to see, word for word here, see. That's how it begins. The first word is, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. God called Joshua to see the victory before the fortified city was delivered into their hands. The word of God is the constitution showing us all that belongs to us. But if we don't see it, Satan is deceiving and robbing us of all that is yours. God can't give you a rightful destiny if you don't believe it and if you can't see it. And Genesis says, whatever you can see, God will give to you. See with your spiritual eyes, through faith. Then you will go where others can't go. Repeat those words with me. When you can see what others can't see, you can go where others can't go. When you can see spiritually what others can't see, you can go where others can't go. Do you know in business, this has helped me many times in business, I've asked God for wisdom and he's shown me things that when I first tell it to my ex go, they, they reject it. But after the third time, it's, it's part of our strategy. It's because God has given me the ability to see what other people can't see. And therefore our business goes in the direction. And when that happens, you get phenomenal it's a game changer because you're able to see what the world views as impossible. And when you do that and you believe that you can go to places that the world didn't think you could go. And that gives you competitive advantage. Now, personal story. My son Christian is eight. He is nine on the 15th of May. And on, he was about four years old. He woke up one morning exhibiting all sorts of strange sounds, first of all. And then from sounds, it became movements. So every five seconds, he violently jerks his head back like this. Every five seconds. So 12 times a minute. I know because I counted them for days. And then he started shrugging. Okay. And then he started eye blinking, like that. And then he played a lot to this song. So can you imagine that in one minute, as a dad, you would look at your son 
and you would see this. He went from a normal, gorgeous, beautiful, perfect human being to a little boy that I didn't recognize. And I, I kneeled with him before we went to the doctor. And I said to, I said to God, I'm going to pay, pray one prayer because that's all you need. One prayer that this little boy will be fully, completely restored to health. I prayed that prayer the next morning. Symptoms were still there. Took him to the pediatrician. Pediatrician asked Christian to wait outside. And he said, so easy. The diagnosis is so easy because the symptoms are so strong. But your son has Tourette's syndrome. So sit down because I need to tell you that this is not a syndrome where I'm going to give you any pills for. This is a syndrome that we have not found a cure for. That's it. That's your lot. That's how your life can change in one second. If you don't have the rock, you fall apart. If you don't have the rock, you will fall apart. And we nearly fell apart with the rock. We went home and we spoke till one o'clock in the morning. We watched every single video, every single piece of paper on the internet, every story written about it. We watched families. And at about half past one in the morning, my wife wailed. She did not cry. She did not scream. She wailed. It was a guttural wail. That my first reaction was not to, to love her and to keep her quiet. I dashed off our bed and shut all our bedroom windows. <laughs> Because I was sure that the neighbors would come, become running in. I mean, it was a terrible, terrible wail. I had my own time of crying in public, uh, sorry, in private. And for three weeks, it just got worse and worse and worse, except after about one week, my wife had complete peace. And she said, Shane, God is waiting for you. He's told me that Christian has Tourette, but he's dealing with you. God is waiting for you. And God said to me, um, you're not designed to go where you can't see. First thing he told me. So I said, cool, God. I, I think I know what that means. I think it means um, you're going to partially heal Christian. And then I'm going to see that. And then I will be able to go and faith the next 75% of his healing. So I kept looking because I'm thinking spiritualized. I'm not designed to go where I can't see. And I can't see anything getting better here. So I'm asking God, show me the little bit of improvement. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you my word, Lord. I will then, with pure faith, I will go the rest of the way. And then it took, it took me about 10 days for God to drop that meaning. So I wrote, fortunately, I wrote every single thing on this device. I've got a chronological order of how God spoke to me. And when it dropped, he said, I'm not calling you to see this with your natural eyes, but your spiritual. I want you to see your son healed, well, and ready. And when you do, when you start believing it, you'll see the manifestation of what you believe. Because I've already healed him, by the way. He said, he's my son before he's yours. Your son is healed, but you need to start seeing it. And then I'm not going to give you the whole story because it, it really is a 40-minute story. But God told me one more thing that I want you to take away with you that will stand you in good stead for the rest of your life. When I say this, I want, to, I want to put my hands up like this, and I want to raise my hands to my king. And you know why? Because he is all-powerful. Because he reigns now during COVID virus. Because he was on the throne before COVID virus. And he will be on the throne when COVID-19 is dead and buried, we have an unmoving rock. So what did he tell me? He told me something so profound. He said, Shane, my boy, the fact is your son has Tourette's. The fact is it is not healable. There's nothing the doctors can do. He said, but 
You are the elect. And so I want to give you something that transcends fact. I want to give you the only thing that is more powerful than fact. It's truth. Truth transcends fact. And then he said, I am the truth. My word is the truth. Now stop making a thousand and one scenarios about how your boy is going to end up. Stop thinking of cleverer prayers. Stop thinking of more things that you will offer and sacrifice for me to heal your boy. Your boy has been healed. Let go of the fact. Relinquish it. Transcend above it. Go into the truth. Open my word and read everything my word says. That when, when I was on earth, when I encountered sickness, what did I do? And I took that truth and I read it over my, I googled every verse uh, on, on healing, New Testament, Old Testament, but mostly New Testament. And instead of praying for my son, I read them over him every night. He, he can recite so many of them now himself. If he was here, I'd ask him to do it for you. And do you know, as, as, it started, as I started talking them, a belief started to grow in my body that I used to leave his room absolutely exhilarated. I couldn't sleep. It was from a joy of the knowledge of the healing of my son. I started seeing it. I started, and then, and then in the end, my, my entire prayer changed. I started thanking God long prior to seeing any healing. I started thanking him. And that our ordeal took between six and eight weeks. And my beautiful son, Christian, is completely, absolutely, 100% healed. Truth is more powerful than fact. God often delivers what you see. Um, and when we see it, we actually rewrite the facts. So, so we knew the facts. The facts were what the doctor said. God said, disregard them and believe me. And when I did that, believing him, do you know what he did with the facts? He rewrote them. God rewrote the facts. So, well, uh, actually, Tourette's, there is a cure for Tourette's. Not medically, but there is a cure. So when you, when you take the truth and, and you take how the world will, lives, in fact, and you transcend to the way God wants you to live in truth, you rewrite these facts and the truth becomes what you hold on to. And we've had, my son is now, like I said, nine, five years. We waited one year to talk about this healing. We wanted to be absolutely sure. We were talking about it for four years. Not enough. So any invitation to come talk, Ryan, if you ever have that opportunity, I'd love to tell the whole story. I, I want to tell it to everybody who listens. The reason being, this is an almighty God we serve. And, and we get anxious about things. And don't be hard on yourself. I've also had moments where I was like, oh, God, you've got something very special planned. Because you saw this coming, and yet you released me out of the chairman of wealth and investment at RMB. You let me go out of that comfort zone to go and run this business. And we've had, I've had one amount of money paid into my bank account since well, I've had nothing in November. I got one in December, January, February, March, April. So one, one amount in six months. I laugh because. God's got it. God's got it. You see, when, when God shows you what he can do with your son, I can't, I can't mistrust him. I can't, I can't not believe him. He's a credible God. Credible. Incredible and credible. So let's talk about the last theme. Ram, just show me a thumbs up. Are we okay for time? Okay, cool. 
navigating through turbulent times. I might challenge you here a little bit. Okay. The opposite of holiness is being common, just like everybody else. When people come into church or when they encounter Christians, they need to see the advantage of Christ in you. If the only difference between Christians and the world is that Christians proclaim Jesus and the world doesn't, if we both, Christians and non-Christians, get depressed, we both get stressed, we both get anxious, we both get filled with fear, then we're not going to stand out. People won't want what is in us. And what is in us? You tell me. Jesus Christ is in us. That's what people want. Don't be fooled that people are attracted to you. They're attracted to what's in you. And when, when that comes out, people are like, I, I, I want to be around that guy more. I don't know why. I don't know why I want to be around that person more. I want to be around that couple more, more and more. I want to feed off them. I want to get some of what they've got. All we've got, well, not all, but we've only got one thing. We've got Christ. And that's all we need. It's all we need. We only need one thing, guys. You know, Christ doesn't say to get through this, you need these 15 things. Now, here's the order. Start at 15. And if you get to one, you've done really well. You probably should make it. God says, you need me. I am your provider. I am your best friend. I am your father. I am your keeper. I will give you favor with man. Be anxious for nothing. Take your anxiety to God and the peace that transcends understanding will keep your heart and keep your mind. For us Christians, we have something the world doesn't have, a way to stabilize emotions. If we don't make use of our emotions, they will erupt because we're not focusing on God. I'm going to skip about quite a bit now because I've, I've probably overstepped um, a little bit. So let me start here. Satan has no authority, unless, but he does use suggestions and deceptions to get us to authorize feeling bad or fearful or depressed. We allow Satan's suggestions or our own ignorance to authorize our own destruction. We speak things or agree with things and open ourselves up to authorize stuff that hurts us. How many times have we been around the bra? Oh, this nation is stuffed. We are, we got nowhere back. Me too. I spoke with an economist. I interviewed an economist, chief financial officer of the first RAND group, uh, retired in January, current guy, smart as anything. He said, and I do believe him. I think, the, I think the cure, what we believe to be the cure, which is the lockdown of people, I think it's going to be more damaging than the illness, which is coronavirus, COVID-19. Uh, that's just my personal view. I think economically, we are really, really getting hurt. But he was quite negative. He wasn't trying to be. He was just saying, we re the economy is retracted by 6%. We're in for a hard ride. We're in for this. We're in for that. We're in for that. I started agreeing and agreeing and agreeing and I, and I left there feeling down and I said, don't author out, don't repeat these things and start talking them conversation. Don't bury your head in the sand, but don't authorize Satan to get into your head to make you mad about these things. Just keep saying there's a truth here and I hold on to the truth. Does that mean that there will be businesses that will not close? Nope. There will be, unfortunately. Does it mean that we'll be shielded and protected from everything? No, but God will work with it. Sometimes God gives you what you need and not what you want. We must be careful how we pray because we generally pray for what we want, what we want, what we want, what we want, what we want. I'm one of those people. Thank you for that. And now that we've done with the thanks, can we move on to what we still want? 
and then we go on what we want. And God is such a lovely father that he gives us so often what we want. But be careful for praying about what you want because you might just miss out on what you need. God is the electrical wiring in your house hook up, hooked up to a massive power grid. But when we want the lights on, it is us who have to flick the switch. God has decided to partner with us. We flick the switch. He supplies the power. All right, then I'm going to talk to you about one more thing, and then we're done. Um, and it's going to be about fishing. I thought, you know, you guys being in the Cape, fishing is going to resonate with you. So when you fish, there's a few things you can do. I'm going to disregard my notes. I just want to talk to you. When you fish, there's a few things you can do. And I, I, I don't fish, so I'm making this up. <laughs> so you can pack your rods and your bait. And you can tell your wife, hey, I'm going early. You won't see me go tomorrow. I'm going nice and early. And you can get down to the beach. But just, just up from the beach is a lack of pub. And you don't even take your fishing rods out. And you go straight to the pub. One way of fishing. Number two. You can go fishing, you can bypass the pub, so you've made step one, and you can go fishing just off the shoreline. Great fun. I've done it a few times where my kids first caught their fish. It's amazing. Or you can go on a little rubber duck, and you can go play around just by back line, and you can throw a rod there, and you can catch some, some decent fish. And then there's a fourth way. You can take a strong sturdy, reliable boat, and you can go into deep waters. Now, I, st I changed my title because I said I wanted this to be a talk where the Holy Spirit leads, leads me, and, and I've left out so much stuff here, so I do feel his prompting. And the prompting is, I feel God wants us to go to deeper waters. Now, in the midst of this crisis, I feel he's calling his elect, Ron, as the leader of that church, a mandate on you, calling you to go to deeper waters. All of us listening as Christ followers, as the elect, a calling to go to deeper waters. But with that, they come, to, they come hand in hand. So it's just a call. It's a call, and then God is telling you how to build your ship. And you are your ship. And I've got goosebumps all over me. And that generally means the Holy Spirit is with me. And he wants me to impart this message. I don't know if you can see. Does, I, does the goosebumps show up at all? I've got goosebumps everywhere on my body. That's generally how the Holy Spirit manifests. And so now let me speak. Um, as best I can. When you build your boat, the thing that is so incredibly important in building a boat is the ballast. The ballast is not a thing of beauty. It's not a gorgeous sail. It's not a polished deck. A ballast doesn't even, it isn't even visible to the eye. The ballast is kept in the keel. And the keel sits in the water. But when you hit stormy times, huge turbulent times while you're in deep water, where God has called you, you think of how strong and sturdy your ballast is. Go Google it. The ballast is the thing in the ship or the boat that will stop you from overturning. Now here's the critical point. The ballast is found below the water. Gentlemen, God 
is speaking directly to your heart to say if you want to survive deep water you need to strengthen your ballast and how do you do that it's below the water it's the unseen it's the it's a part that nobody knows about you strengthen your ballast by going on your knees quietly without anybody watching without anybody seeing what you're doing and you build your relationship with the king of kings with the master sailor with the one who spoke the sea to be quiet with his words he stilled the waves he stilled the waters go and strengthen your ballast because i believe now that what is to come will be worse than what it is now and we need to have strong ballasts and those ballasts will not be found we will not strengthen those ballasts in any other way god is talking not right now about anything else but about you and him quietly in his word and then reading his word then talking to him and then lastly listen carefully about this having a time of quietness to listen to what he wants you to do so often in my prayer time uh, i set an alarm because i know if i don't leave at that time um you know then then i miss my meeting so so i, I try and get in as many times but when the alarm goes off it's time to go then i know if i don't go up, i'm going to leave our meeting get rid of it get rid of it this is a time for when god is done with you he will release you to say get on with your day's work and that's hard because i'm asking you to go out of your way for god but it is the only way that when these these storms get wilder and more vicious that your ship will stay stable it is you and him plugging in you plugging into god and getting the umbilical cord of christ in you so that he shows you what to do that he strengthens the identity that you have in him that he makes you all powerful that you do not sway left or right or if you do sway left or right you are certain that it's not ever going to end up upside down strengthen your ballast by spending time with yourself and god only below the waters closed doors you and him thank you guys that's me awesome thank you shane uh, can anyone else hear me anrik okay you can all hear me well just thank you shane so much for those words i think it's so encouraging um, I loved what Shane said about the ballast. Uh, I do believe in these uncertain times that we need to have a sure foundation. We need something that will keep us balanced in the midst of this uh, huge storm that we're facing. Uh, I also love the fact that Shane spoke about uh, seeing is not always believing or seeing can be believing, depending on who, what you're seeing. Um, I do believe that God has the ability to to actually impart vision into us that no one else has yet seen. And I think what we need is to realize that when God shows us things, like for example, the Wright brothers, they saw in their mind what it would be like to fly um, and then actually achieved it. And I'm, I'm probably guessing that actually the, the, the actual flight itself was far better than what they could have imagined. And I believe that's what God wants for us. God wants us to see it um, and then achieve it. And uh, the Wright brothers never kept their flight to themselves. In fact, we are all bene beneficiaries of their success. So I do believe if our businesses are set on that fact, seeing what God wants us to see, and then also if our businesses, uh, the, the benefactors, the, the people who benefit from it, it's not just us, but everyone around us, I believe there's an even bigger and greater blessing on that. So I think, uh, Heinrich, what we can do is um, we can just do some uh, Q&A for the next 10, 15 minutes. Is that okay? 
Um, so those who are on the Zoom profile, you can uh, ask your questions. And then those on Facebook, if you can write down your questions so that Heinrich and myself can maybe just um, uh, repeat that for Shane's benefit. Is that okay, Heinrich? Yes, yeah, let's do it. I'm going to unmute everybody. So anybody that wants to ask a question, you're welcome. Okay, let's see. <laughs> we can do Okay, so I'm just looking on Facebook. I don't see anything at this stage, but I'm sure the guys will write um, some questions now. Shane, I've got a question for you. So obviously in the business world, um, you know, this is um, territory that I don't think any businessman, business lady has ever gone through. Um, and when you're going through a, a time period that no one else has gone through, it's called trailblazing. Literally, whatever decision you make, um, the you know, there is no right or wrong decision. Eventually, you know, uh, you'll hit it right, you're going to hit it wrong. But would you agree with me that in this time period, it's, it is important to make decisions. We can't sit idle and pretend that this is all going to go away. Um, would you agree with me when I say that in terms of following God, sometimes we follow God uh, in the storm uh, and we need to hear his voice, but there has to be action. Like, for example, Peter having to get off the boat he had to hear the voice, but then he had to take action. He got off the boat. So um, would you agree with me when I say that in the midst of this lockdown, it's important that we actually start making decisions. We start having some form of action in our lives or not. Yeah, so it is unprecedented territory. I would agree with you 100%. Uh, JFK wanted to go to the, the moon um, the Wright brothers who wanted to be the first in manpowered flight, neither of them dreamt and then sat back and chilled. The, the, the doing, the stepping, is where the beauty comes. Um, very often they say that the best antidote for anxiety is action. And even in my business, if I look at what I've done, all I've done is my business has not stopped. It's just changed direction. So I made an immediate decision to say, what can I leverage online? And, and we made that call. I made that call with two advisors um, about a week before we were locked down. We could see it was coming and we went for it. There is a, there's a saying that says um, the worst thing, the best thing you can do is make the right decision. The second best thing you can do is to make the wrong decision. And the very worst thing you can do is to not to make any decision. So you need to do. You need to do. You can't be caught in what I called earlier paralysis of an action. Because then when things do resume, you're going to be so far behind. You need to plot a course and you need to stay on that course. And that course needs to be flexible. So if, if, it's, if the world starts moving this way, then we can adjust our course slightly. That's, that's strategic. All strategic plans need to have built-in flexibility to have a look at where the world is going to go. Not a bad idea, very difficult to predict, but not a bad idea when you're starting your strategy to start looking to say, where do, now that we've gone through this, what do I think the world will look like in three years? And that's a tough thing, but I've done it. So I've had, I've said, Everything that we thought we were doing has been massively accelerated by our lockdown because we've, we've been forced to accelerate, particularly digital communication. So if that continues, what will business look like in three years' time? And then is my business now future ready? So that was my first bit. Is my business future ready? Well, my business is largely face-to-face, -face, so I think I need to get my online stuff and my online profile and get this mug seen a little bit more on, on, um, did on Facebook and on Instagram. But Ron, I agree 100%. We, we cannot sit idle. We need to do. Absolutely. And then also, you know, um, one thing we've realized is that, and I like what you said, we've got to look at, at what the future looks like. 
But also there's a key word here. We've got to look at what the needs are right now. So if we want our businesses or our lives, and in fact, any area of our lives to make any form of impact, we've got to, we've got to be where the needs are. And I would suggest to anyone that's in businesses to look at what the current needs are, what future needs will be. And if we have businesses in line with that, um, there will always be business. It's, yes. you, know, you know, if that makes sense. So I think yeah. for all the business guys listening here, we, we, and this is where what you said is so important, Shane, we actually got to be relying on God because no one, I didn't know last year that there would be a lockdown this year. I don't think anyone knew that, but imagine if you had some form of inkling that something like this was taking place. Imagine if you were prepared. Now, a lot of people say, well, in life, there's always going to be things that you, that's going to take, take you on that you're not prepared for. And that's the truth. Uh, or should I say that's a fact. But the truth is that if we look at someone like Joseph, God pre-warned him that there was a famine coming. God pre-warned him that there was a need that would arise. And Egypt became a superpower because they prepared for that need. And my prayer for all the business people listening today is that God would already give us insight, give us wisdom, give us vision, like you said, so that we can prepare for the current needs and even the future needs. Because let's be honest, that's what makes business great. And that's where we can be a benefit, not only to ourselves, but to those in need. Um, yeah, sure. Would you agree with that? Yes. So I, I think step one, and you can put this in bold pen. Step one is start on your knees. And then step two, start devising something, a direction, that you want to go on and implement it. Actually, start actioning it and start doing it. Very often, when you tell a story, you actually have to tell the story at the end. Because if you tell the story from the beginning, it doesn't make sense. In other words, sometimes God takes you on journeys purposefully. So if you're plugged into him, if, you, if you, you're flicking the switch, but he's the power source, then be obedient to what he wants you to do. Be sure it's him. When God speaks to me, I don't move unless I'm absolutely sure. He knows, I, he knows my psyche, and so he, he, he's good to me. He gives me absolutely insur assurance through other people. Then be obedient. So our job is to, to hear God and then to do what he tells us. And then often it makes no worldly sense. I, I want to warn you about that. It makes no worldly sense what God, sometimes God asks you to do stuff where when he asked me to resign and he said, not then, now, it made no sense. I, I argued with him. We argued. I said that I will be leaving a, 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 a huge sum of money if I resign now. And he said, I need you to go now. Now, at the time, if I was telling you that story, I would be telling it like I, I've just have. To say, listen, I'm going to resign because I know I've heard from God. But the truth of the matter is, he is, um, you know, through my physical eyes, he's doing it at the, uh, the worst possible time. If you ask me why now he wanted me to resign then, it's clear. I don't want to go into it, but it's absolutely crystal clear. He saved me from a lot and was able to give me so much more out uh, with my resignation. So sometimes what God leads you to does not make sense. But if you're sure it's from him, do it anyway. It'll make sense in time. Sure. That's very good, Shane. I've got a question here from Jason Keith. He said, uh, Shane, when fear sneaks in, how do you handle it on a daily basis? So I think for me, important is, is to understand what fear is and where it comes from. So fear is mostly spiritual, and yet we fight fear mostly physically. So God speaks against fear. He instructs us. He says, be anxious for nothing. I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So, so in, immediately we can say, 
is fear from God? No. Okay, so that's important grounding, eh? So to answer that question, you've got to say, where's the source? Is fear from God? No. Are there genuinely things that we could worry about? <laughs> yeah. If a green mama slithers towards me, I'm, I'm going to be fearful, and I'm going to go in the opposite direction. But I think what we're talking about is the fear of, is our futures disappearing? When's our next income coming from? Fear is not from God. So when you understand where the source is, then you must be active and deliberate in taking it to God. Because if you resist fear and you resist, who is fear now? It is Satan. If you resist him, he shall flee. So I think fight it on a spiritual sense. Go on your knees, fight it, hand it to God and be so you can't just hand it to God and then walk away and think, okay, well, it's not going to come into my mind again. Well, the, the whole battlefield that God and Satan fight is right here. They fight it here all the time. And so you need to be consciously aware of removing fear. The minute it comes in, remove it. And I don't mean don't entertain it. If there's a genuine fear, write it down, get things in order, get a plan on how to deal with it. The fear I'm talking about is the fear you're talking about. It is that same fear that comes and, and it's like a yapping poodle that bites at your, um, it's not an Alsatian that we run and jump on the couch, just a little yapper, but it goes at your ankles and it is irritating as anything and it won't let go and it won't let go and it mulls around in our heads over and over and over. Take that captive and lead it out of your head. That's good. All right, guys, any other questions you want to ask? Are we all good? No. Ryan, Ryan can I just say, Shane, thank you so much for your message. Um, I think it's been very encouraging uh, to me. Um, and, and so um, it's given us, or certainly given me, a few things to think about and mull over and, and put into action. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, personally. It's my pleasure. Cool. Uh, just, just, just one quick one, Shane. Don't you think that given the circumstances and given what we've got, this is a, a golden opportunity for us to, to literally shine and as, as Ryan mentioned earlier, be literally trailblazers. It's, you know, we can turn this, this uh, well, us, but through God, we can, we can turn this whole situation into a an absolute win where people are looking at us and saying, what the heck's up with these guys? I mean, everyone's not making it, but they are. Why? Yeah, Just, uh, absolutely. So I think two things. I think God will look after his people. Um, and then even if you are going through adversity, your response is because you have Christ within you. I think, I think that is the, you know, more than what we say, I think the testimony of how we live is what changes people. Um, Rory Dyer told me this one day, and, and, and it was a, it's something that stuck with me. He said to me, Shane, if I have measles, but I tell you I've got chicken pox, so I've got, I've got the diagnosis wrong. I'm actually infected with measles, but when I greet you, I'll shake your hand and I'll say, hey, by the way, but I've got chicken pox, so you must wash your hands. If I didn't wash my hands, what would I be infected with? Measles or chicken pox? Right, right, exactly. You get infected with what yeah. you, you infect people with what you have, not what you say. So it is great to talk and it's encouraging and it is uplifting. And when you speak God's word, it, it releases massive power. But if you want to influence people, people need to see what you have. Because what you have is crossed in you. And that is so infectious. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. If I, if I can just close uh, with this thought, um, Heinrich, if that's okay. Um, I, I believe that when, when we've got God on our side, we're hearing his voice. He's our anchor. He's our balance. He, he keeps us balanced. He looks after us through uh, the storms. Um, 
I believe with all this in mind, we, he hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So that means we, we need to have boldness. It means we've got to be brave. It means we've got to step up. It doesn't mean that we, we don't sink and we don't have that inkling of fear, but it does mean that we put our trust in God uh, through all this. We don't put our trust, like it was said last week, we don't put our trust in the government. We don't put our trust in the banks, the bailouts, the promises from man. We put our, promise, we put our faith in the promises of God. But one thing I have realized, and I just look at the way the Phillies Church has gone on with the um, with the lockdown, and how many of you, as you're listening here, have carried on with business in a certain way. We have to be at a place where we are brave enough to make decisions. Um, we have to start making decisions. Like I, I'm, I was so encouraged, and Andre, you uh, um, you might not know this, but for the very fact that you open up about your business, how uh, you had to have your staff take 50% uh, of their salary and understand that 50% is better than nothing. And you have to make do with the current financial decision, the, this time you're in. What encouraged me is that Andre actually made a decision. He didn't sit back and relegate it to someone else. He made the decision. And that my opinion is an act of faith. Every time we make a decision, it's an act of faith. If we decide we are going to relaunch our businesses, um, well, that is a decision of faith. If you decide that you're going to focus more on an online market, well, that is a decision. Whatever the decision you make, um, like Shane said, don't look at the facts, look at the truth, number one. Secondly, have a dream. I want to encourage, I, I, I really took a lot away from that. We got a dream again. Guys, uh, when we entered business the first time, come on, let's be honest. Every person on Facebook, every person on, on this platform, when we entered business, we had a dream. We had a dream of accomplishing. We had a dream of providing. Don't let that dream die. Rebirth it, rebrand it, relook at it, get God's view on it. Uh, ask him to open your eyes so that you see that there's actually more for you than against you. Um, I really believe that we, we can see an incredible success in any business represented here. Uh, like Shane is saying, his business is face to face. He can't do that at the moment, but that's not stopping him from dreaming where he'll be in five years, 10 years time from now. And we got to be the same. So guys, ladies, thank you so much for joining us. I think it's been uh, really beneficial to every single one of us. Shane, once again, on behalf of uh, our church, on behalf of everyone that's uh, partaken today and listened to this message, thank you. It's encouraging. It's faith building. And uh, that's all we need. We need encouragement. We need our faith to be built. And the challenge is let's go out there and let's do it. So Heinrich, I'm going to hand to you. and You can just do all the formalities of closing. But um, Shane, once again, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Eh? Thank you so much, Ron. I really appreciate the opportunity. No, that's it. <clears throat> thank you very much, Shane, for coming to speak to us. It was really insightful. I think a lot of food for thought as well, stuff that we can take away, we can pray about. And I think the guys on Facebook, I'm going to stop the feed that side now. So um, it was nice having you guys online as well. And then um, for the guys that, that's on the group as well, I'll be I'll be putting the recording on YouTube as well. So I'll share the link with you guys. And Shane, if you want a copy of this recording, I'll, 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 I'll send it to you as well. And then um, if you really want to share it with somebody along the line, it's always nice to keep um, a database of talks um, available, you know, especially if, you, if you're thinking of, um, digitizing your business um, yeah. is always nice to have some ammo hidden in a way yeah. somewhere. So, yeah, so it's, been, it's really been awesome to have you, sure. And um, I think we would really love to hear your testimony about your about your son as well at some stage.